Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Elwood. I'm the Dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard University. And it's my special pleasure to welcome you to this, the Theodore H. White Lecture on Press and Politics, something sponsored by the Joan Sorenstein Center for the Press and Politics. Truly, uh, this is one of the great nights of the year. And the fact that we have such an amazing audience uh, on a Sunday evening, um, a cool Sunday evening, is a testament both to the significance of the event, but also, of course, to the remarkable people that we'll be uh, listening to and honoring tonight. My job is to get off the stage pretty quickly, actually. Um, but I want to just say a couple of words quickly. First of all, uh, we lost Walter Shorenstein this year. And Walter was one of the really great human beings, one of the great figures of American politics, someone who cared very, very deeply about issues of transparency and accountability, but also progressive values of a very uh, significant sort and many other such issues. One of his great legacies has been the Walter Shorenstein, I mean the Joan Shorenstein Center for Press and Politics and Public Policy. Uh, and it's uh, in honor of his daughter uh, who passed away, who was a remarkable journalist in her own right. And so it is altogether wonderful and fitting that on this evening that we have such a spectacular program. He was a, a, he's a terrific man. Now he, we do have uh, both, I believe Doug and Carol uh, are here. Uh, both Shorenstein, Doug, where are you? There you are, right there, I'm sorry, I'm blind as a bat. There's Doug and Carol. <laughs> And actually, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you all to give a big round of applause to Walter Shorenstein, because he would love it. <laughs> and Carol, here, you're here with your husband Jeff and your daughter uh, Gracie, so welcome to all of you. We're really glad to have you. So uh, I will not spend any more time up on the stage other than this to al introduce very briefly Alex Jones another remarkable human being who was a terrific journalist, uh, and a, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who's uh, covered the media and many other kinds of activities, worked for the New York Times, wrote a book about the New York Times, uh, has done a magnificent job here this year of running the uh, Shorenstein Center. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Alex Jones. Thank you, and thank you, David. Thank all of you for being here. Each year this night is uh, one of celebration for the Shorenstein Center. Tonight is a celebration, but it's one that is bittersweet. As some of you already know, the Shorenstein Center was founded in 1986 as a memorial, as David said, to Joan Shorenstein Barone, a truly remarkable television journalist who died of breast cancer after a distinguished journalistic career at CBS. Her father, Walter Shorenstein, endowed the center as a place for a focused and searching examination of the intersection of the press, politics, and public policy. Walter Shorenstein not only made the center possible, but remain vitally interested in what we do and was our unstinting supporter and friend. As you have heard from David, in June, after a long and extraordinary life, Walter Shorenstein died at 95. I would like to begin tonight's celebration by paying tribute to the man who made it possible. Walter was indeed an extraordinary man. As a young man, he found himself after World War II with an honorable discharge from the Army and a couple of thousand dollars and decided to make his life in San Francisco. His first great achievement was using his brains and character, and it took both brains and character, to turn his small stake into one of the nation's greatest commercial real estate empires. Those who knew Walter, and I consider it my privilege to be among them, know that he loved to tell stories about his often rocky rise in the cutthroat world of commercial real estate. Walter's secret was not just that he often saw opportunities that others did not see, but that he took pains to make sure that those doing business with him always got their money's worth. He took pains to understand his buildings from the inside out and from the bottom up, the janitors and the elevator operators and the people who kept the heating system working knew him and he knew them. 
Needless to say, he was a stunning business success. But the thing that made Walter Shorenstein a great man was that he was also a great citizen of this country. He cared about what was happening and then used his wealth to try to do something about it. He was one of the wise men of the Democratic Party, not merely a man who wrote checks, though he did that too. He was listened to, and he had genuine wisdom to impart. He looked over the horizon with a kind of prescience that is rare, and right up to the last days of his life, he was engaged in the world's affairs. I'm proud to say that at his memorial service in San Francisco, his son, Doug Shorenstein, who is here, said that the two achievements that made his father proudest were his family and the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He was our goad and our great friend, our benefactor and our visionary ally. I can say quite frankly that he inspired us. We should all live the life of Walter Shorenstein. The Kennedy School is a place built for people who come here to learn how they can change the world. That is why the Shorenstein Center belongs here and why it is so fitting that it should be so big a part of Walter Shorenstein's enduring legacy. We miss him very much. I'm very glad to say that the gauntlet has been passed. With us tonight, as David said, are his son Doug, his daughter Carol Shorenstein Hayes, and Carol's husband Jeff, their daughter, Gracie, and I hope that we're going to be joined later by Wally, who missed his train. <laughs> also, is, here is Walter's great niece, uh, Marissa Shorenstein. I would ask all the members of the Shorenstein family, please, to stand while we pay tribute to Walter Shorenstein and to his remarkable family. A bit later, you will hear from our Theodore White lecturer for 2010, Rachel Maddow. But first, I have another task to perform, which is an honor. In 2005, we at the Shorenstein Center lost another much admired friend, David Nyan, when he died unexpectedly. Some of you did not know David, and I want to speak of him briefly as we this year bestow the sixth annual David Nyan Prize for political journalism. David Nyan was a man of many parts, a devoted family man, a loyal pal, and the best company in the world. He was a real Boston guy, a big, handsome man with a mischievous smile, sparkly eyes, and the rare power to raise everyone's spirits and make it seem like a party just by walking into the room. I saw him do it again and again during the time he was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. But tonight we honor David Nyan, the consummate reporter and political journalist, which is the role that occupied much of his life and at which he could not be bested. David was a reporter and then a columnist at the Boston Globe, and his work had both a theme and a character. The theme was almost always power, political power, and also especially the abuse of political power at the, by the big shots at the expense of the little guys. He also loved politicians. As a group, he respected them. He felt they were often given a raw deal and judged by a standard that was smug and sanctimonious, two things David never was. He was a self-avowed liberal and not defensive about it. Were he with us today, he would relish the coming battle for the White House and would have savored the fact that Massachusetts bucked the national trend and stayed firmly democratic in the congressional elections. And he would have had some fun with Sarah Palin. <laughs> but he would not have been predictable. He was always surprising his readers with his takes on things because most of all, David Nyan was his own man and he called them as he saw them. In his memory and honor, the Nyan family and many friends and admirers of David Nyan have endowed the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism to recognize the kind of gutsy, stylish, and relentless journalism that David Nyan embodied. David's wife Olivia is with us tonight, as are his children Veronica, Kate, and Nick, and other members of the Nyan family, 
and I would like to ask them to all please stand. This year's Nyan Prize winner is William Grider, who comes very much out of the David Nyan tradition of a life devoted to political journalism, in his case from an economics perspective. There are two things that you should know about Bill Grider that may give you a sense of him as a person and as a pundit. The first is that on his personal website, he has included a picture of himself nestled in the list of best-selling book titles he has written on economics, power, and politics. It's a close-up headshot of him with a red ball on his nose, the kind of cl the clowns wear. <laughs> he is also a man who wrote a book in 1997 on globalization called One World, Ready or Not, The Manic Logic of Global Capitalism that was criticized by an, the eminent economist Paul Krugman in the kind of take no prisoners way Krugman has when he disagrees. Grider has since had the rare and no doubt savory experience of saying in his 2009 book, Come Home America, the rise and fall and redeeming promise of our country, of saying in that book that Krugman, in his wisdom, has come closer to Grider's views. <laughs> A very gentle way of saying, I was right, you were wrong. <laughs> William Grider has strong views and he's been expressing them journalistically for 40 years. After Princeton and the Army, he worked at several small and regional newspapers. From there, he came, became a member of the staff, the national staff of the Washington Post for a dozen years, and eventually became the assistant managing editor and director of the, all their national coverage. He also edited Outlook, the Post's Sunday opinion section, and wrote a weekly column called, most appropriately, Against the Grain. But then he did something that I think was not entirely unlike his decision to post a picture of himself with a clown's nose on his website. He left the post for the next 17 years was a regular political columnist for Rolling Stone magazine. He said that he made the surprising move because he wanted to develop his own critical perspective. I learned how to explain the complexities of politics and government with clarity and without the condescension that's typical of the mainstream media, he said. Newspapers talk down to average readers without knowing it. They do not respect the intelligence of ordinary citizens or explain the deeper context of power politics in ways people can understand. I made a personal commitment to do that for them in Rolling Stone and my books. His books have been both successful and influential and always revealing and penetrating. His first big splash was the education of David Stockman which began as a series of articles in the Atlantic Monthly, and was focused on the fallacies and contradictions of Reaganomics in intimate detail. There followed many others, among the ones I have named, among them the ones I have named. Perhaps his most powerful and far-reaching book was Secrets of the Temple, How the Federal Reserve Runs the Country, which was published nearly 25 years ago. It won the Los Angeles Times Book Award and is still in print, and certainly the role of the Federal Reserve has never been more salient to our national conversation. Despite his critical perspective, Bill Grider has also maintained an enduring optimism, something very much in the David Nyan tradition. It isn't a Panglossian optimism, but it seems to be a sort of faith that the ordinary Americans for whom he writes in battle still have the capacity to make ours a better country. If only they will step up and reclaim their role as citizens in the full meaning of the word. It is for his constant encouragement of that end that we have named him the 2010 winner of the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism, Bill Greider. Thank you. Um, that feels good. That's a pretty good biography for me. <laughs> Left out some dark moments there, but that was good. <laughs> um, I was going to start with um, an awkward admission. 
what I think Alex has sort of maybe already explained it, but when word got around the nation that I was going to win a prize from Harvard, some of my younger colleagues began muttering, is Greider sold out? <laughs> <laughs> and you understand, in some sectors of the society, Larry Summers stands for Harvard. <laughs> I know that's terribly unfair, but he, that's, that's just, you can't help it. Uh, and I had just written a few weeks before a rather intemperate blog on Larry Summers titled, Professor Pants on Fire, <laughs> which I just enjoyed writing that piece. <laughs> and I've known Professor Summers for you know, a little bit for many years, and we've had our moments before. But here was the cutting of cord, you know. Our friendship was over after that blog. I, do, I didn't know David um, well. We crossed paths on campaign trails. And I think, I hope he knew, I certainly knew we were kindred spirits, because what would read him and, and maybe late night in bars understand uh, that we had a similar, very similar understanding of, of America and what matters, and we're gonna stay with that, whatever happened to politics. I did know Joan Shorenstein much better. She was a young researcher, I think for David Broder, maybe for wide, more widely in the newsroom when I was a young reporter in the newsroom. She was younger than me. And she was, a, as people know, have said, a beautiful person, smart, full of integrity, generous of spirit. And um, so between those two, I feel uh, honored, deeply honored, and, and flattered to be uh, associated with those names. Um, then I Googled some of the previous winners of this award, and I thought, boy, I am really in good company. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I want to go back to a little bit of what David introduced, which is um, people make different choices, and they're all reasonable within one's own terms. But I did, I did having been at the, you know, the A-ring of, of Washington politics at the Post at a very exciting time, 60s and 70s, and, and getting to understand things pretty well in Washington came away with a feeling of um, the divide between governing elites and people at large. And that's not a partisan or, or ideological statement. It's, it's just the way things were. The book I wrote uh, nearly 20 years ago called Who Will Tell the People, that was the theme. And uh, it, was, it was not well received in the, in the Marble City, I have to say, but, but, uh, but it, held up as a thesis pretty, pretty starkly over the years. Just to be provocative, I will put in a good word for the Tea Party crowd. They said a lot of stupid, fantastically cockamamie and ugly things, but they got one thing right, which was their anger at, at the governing elites, and they were under the circumstances, reasonably bipartisan about that, as you know. They took down as many Republicans as they did Democrats. Um, and uh, I hope they stay with it. Because I think their perception, and you have to screen out a lot of the junk, but, but they were saying what I can tell you is uh, not universally, but, but preponderantly understood by Americans. That something in the political system and particularly in the governing system is not their game anymore. And as I say, this is not exactly a new perception. Uh, it has deepened, it has taken different shapes, some of them cuckoo, some of them right on. But, I, but we're now, as you know, in uh, what I regard as a really pivotal moment in American history. That's what my last book was about. Um, and it's not just the deficits. It's not just trade system. It's not just wars. 
It's all of those things, along with some other equally large um, forces bearing down on our country. We have a rough, rough time ahead, and it's not going to be over in the next election or the election after that. It's going to go on for a generation. And my cockeyed thesis was that, that we will come out on the other side of that if, if, if we attend as a better place, way better than what we are now or what we, what we have, have been. Um, but because I'm talking to Harvard collectively, and I hope a friendly way, you really need to attend to what the Tea Party folks were saying. I promise you, you can go into the ranks of organized labor, not just the labor leaders, but in any workplace, you will hear the same thing. You can go into the middle management of major corporations, where I did a good deal of my reporting on the global economy, and you will hear said a little differently, but basically the same thing. This is, the, this is a great rupture. Nobody has to blame anybody for it. It, it's, it developed over 30 or 40 years, the f collapse of the political parties. I could go on and on. I don't want to do that. I just want to say, listen earnestly to what folks are saying, and don't be misled by their occasional rants. I'll give you one example, and then I'll sit down. It's right before us, which is the issue of Social Security. It is not a mistake that Social Security is the most popular engine of the federal government. I mean universally beloved. And yet, we are now looking at a, at a discussion of near unanimity among governing elites. I mean the think tanks, both political parties, all of the right economists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that, well, we have to whack Social Security. And I'm going to use harsh language because that's what, that's what they have in mind. I'm a careful newspaper reader of, of at least three of our best newspapers every day, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. I will say to you, I have yet to read an honest story in any of those newspapers about the condition of Social Security. Reporters and editors reflexively assume that what the responsibles are saying is correct, that Social Security is this spinning out of control or, or is a burden that drives our deficits, etc. If they wrote, if they did a little reporting, uh, independent of what the responsibles have told them, they would discover, first of all, that Social Security has not contributed a dime to the federal deficits. Quite the contrary. For 30 years, 25 years, Social Security has built up huge surpluses because all working people were paying in a higher FICA tax and money went to the Social Security Trust Fund. It's now around two and a half trillion dollars According to the actuaries, it's going to rise to about $4 trillion. What happened to that money is that the federal government, separate from the Social Security Trust Fund, borrowed that money and spent it. They spent it partly on the, ta the, the regressive tax cuts, which the Reagan years passed, on a couple of wars, on uh, all sorts of other trinkets that the Pentagon managed to construct, on and on, now we're approaching the moment, a few years hence, where the federal government has to pay that money back. That's the crisis of Social Security. And I promise you, every economist, every policymaker who is waving the, 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 the red bloody shirt about Social Security knows those facts. I don't know whether the reporters know them or not. They ought to. But you see what I'm driving at. They, they're, they're lumping Social Security together with Medicare, which does indeed have big fiscal problems, and the rest of government. And they want the folks who paid in that money to pay 
for the loss of government revenues caused by whom? By the same people who, who A, drove globalization to its present state of imbalance, but also the bankers who led the country to ruin in this decade. Um, I'll stop. I, I think I've made my point. <laughs> this is not a secret stuff. It's, it's just what people ought to know before they make up their minds. And, and I, I will end finally just to say thank you again and to say um, I have enormous confidence and I learned it not from Princeton where I had glorious four years, Joe Nye remembers me as a classmate, but, um, but I learned it as a reporter and, and, uh, and that's why I'm an optimist because I, I, I know folks and I have a lot of faith that they'll get there. Thank you. Theodore H. White was also a consummate reporter whose passion was politics. He came to Harvard on a newsboy scholarship and went on to a very distinguished career as a journalist and also a historian. Indeed, Teddy White, as he was universally known, changed both political journalism and politics when he wrote The Making of the President 1960 about the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. For the first time, he raised the curtain on the warts and all side of presidential campaigns and changed forever the candor and behind the scenes drama that is now the heart of campaign coverage. He followed that first book with three more, Making of the President's Books in 1964, 68, and 72. No one has yet surpassed those smart and groundbreaking examinations of what happens and why in the maelstrom of a political campaign. And it is fair to say that Teddy White's heirs are the journalists of today who try to, piece, who try to pierce the veil of politics to understand what is happening and then analyze and deliver the goods to those of us who are trying to understand. Before his death in 1986, Teddy White was one of the architects of what became the Shorenstein Center. One of the first moves of Marvin Kalb, the center's founding director, was to raise the funds and establish the Theodore H. White Lecture on the press, politics, on press and politics in his honor. This year, the White Lecture is to be delivered by Rachel Maddow, the shy, reticent, <laughs> utterly non-combative host of, of MSNBC's Rachel Maddow Show. She is widely regarded to be the most incisive, the most intellectually nimble, the wittiest, and also most genuinely, genuinely thoughtful person on cable news. I'm not sure Sean Hannity or Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh feel that way, but if your politics tend to be democratic and you like to see a really smart person going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Fox News team, then Rachel Maddow is apt to be a hero to you. Some of you may have seen her recent interview of Jon Stewart, in which Stewart called her out for MSNBC's role in fostering political polarization. She listened. She didn't necessarily agree, but she listened. That is part of her strength. She listens, thinks, and reacts, all apparently in a flash. Tonight, we have invited her to reflect, and I very much look forward to what she has to say. So who is Rachel Maddow? She is a woman who at 17 came out as a lesbian by posting notes, announcing it in all the bathroom stalls of her school <laughs> before telling her parents. <laughs> she has described herself as a big lesbian who, as she says, looks like a dude. <laughs> she has said that even as a young girl with long blonde hair, she looked like a young boy with young blonde hair. The point is, she seems utterly comfortable with who she is. And that has given her a solid, powerful foundation from which to speak her mind. She began doing that on radio talk, as a radio talk show host, worked for Air America, the liberal talk, liberal talk radio network. Then she started filling in for Keith Olbermann on NBC's, NBC, MSNBC. He's the other powerful liberal voice there. The thing is, the chemistry that television sometimes allows happened. 
She connected with her audience, and her audience connected with her profoundly. She is a Californian, a graduate of Stanford, a Rhodes Scholar, and now divides her time between New York and Northampton, Massachusetts. She actually came to Western Massachusetts to finish her dissertation because, her words, I wanted to move somewhere where I'd be unhappy. <laughs> I have no interest in New England, hate winter, don't like the country, not fond of animals. <laughs> Rachel Maddow. She is equally, unexpected, equally unexpectedly direct in her commentary, interviews, and reporting. People describe her using words such as fearless and hypnotic. They talk about her flashing eyes. And she has attracted a host of fans, straight and gay, whose online posts have title lines such as, Why We're Gay for Rachel Maddow. <laughs> Most recently, she has hurled herself into the firefight over whether Keith Olbermann, her colleague and friend, should have been suspended for making a donation to Democratic candidates, which is against NBC's rules. She took the position that MSNBC's suspension of Olbermann was a demonstration that MSNBC was a news channel rather than a political vehicle for the Republican Party, like Fox News. She is an avowed liberal, but not a party apologist. She bolsters her argument as this by saying that she frequently criticizes Democrats, and President Obama has certainly come in for some sharp Maddow analysis. She is, in other words, her own very strong political voice, one intended to serve the things she loves, like her country and the Constitution. She thinks of herself as an observer, a passionate observer with a point of view, but also with intellectual honesty. Massachusetts surprise Republican Senator Scott Brown paid her the dubious compliment of raising money by claiming she planned to run against him in 2012. <laughs> she said it was not true. She kept, he kept making the claim and raising money with it. She responded by buying a full-page ad in the Boston Globe confirming that she was not going to be a candidate and demanding an apology. She also observed that Senator Brown has declined repeated invitations to come on her show. I suspect we all know why. <laughs> it is my honor to present the Theodore H. White Lecture for 2010, Rachel Maddow. Wow, um, it's very uh, humbling to be here, and that was a very, very, very kind introduction, so thank you. Um, I do not think of myself as the kind of person who wins awards like this, uh, or who is invited to places like this, or who gets you all to come out on a night like this when the Patriots are about to kick off. Um, so thank you for this honor. I also wanna say um, uh, thank you on behalf of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America who um, are receiving my honorarium for receiving this award tonight. <clears throat> so last year, uh, in what I believe was the 20th annual Theodore H. White Lecture here at Harvard, your honoree Taylor Branch um, started his address with a received problem. Uh, a problem he described as the slow evaporation of mainstream journalism in our era. And his lecture asked whether journalism's self-evident death was rather more inglorious than it needed to be because journalism hadn't just become unsustainable from a business perspective, journalism had become bad on its own terms. It's an uncomfortable question and a bold one and a brave one I thought to ask here. Um, but, but, it, but it's also, in addition to that being an uncomfortable question, it is also an uncomfortable reality that the loss of reporting jobs, the slashing of newsroom resources, the financial apocalypse among newspapers and print magazines is almost totally unlamented beyond those of us who are in this profession. 
maybe it also includes those of us who feel romantic about this profession, but beyond us mugs, nobody really cares. The country hates the press. Among objective reporters and anchors, even the most intrepid and accomplished are now derided for having a secret agenda, for having an ax to grind, for having some veiled bias that's transparent only to those who do not share it. Politically neutral reporters are disparaged as the lamestream media, right? The lamestream media, which is this year's politically fashionable schoolyardy update of just calling the media liberal. <laughs> among those of us who are not political conscientious objectors, among those of us who do not hide or disown our points of view, undoubtedly we are considered heroes by some people who agree with us uh, and villains by some who disagree. But um, to the larger group, or maybe to the, the commentariat that considers uh, itself to be above political inclinations of their own, uh, people who claim to agree with us only when we are right and to disagree with us only when we are wrong, um, to that group, our very existence, my very existence, is scorned as existence of the guttural malignancy of America's anti-culture. This country hates the press. Not just some of it, all of it. All the lawyer jokes you can tell in the 80s, you can now make them into TV anchor jokes. When the New York Times published an account of the National Security Agency's unprecedented spying on Americans without our knowledge or without our assent, claims by the right, by some on the right, that the paper's editors should be killed for the transgression of publishing that story, those claims were greeted with the kind of mild eyebrow raising that we usually save for angry emails that lapse into all capital letters or uh, misfired tweets. As someone who speaks overtly from the left to an audience that is not entirely of the left but which expects to hear liberal opinion from me, the closest thing I know of uh, as a way to goose my own ratings is to showcase some villainous behavior from a media figure on the right. I am not particularly interested in conservative media, um, so this doesn't happen very often, but when bad behavior by a host on the Fox News channel or someone who is well known in conservative talk radio, uh, when that story is newsworthy enough, in my estimation, to make our show, our viewers lock in and our ratings go up. Am I particularly entertaining or incisive when I'm talking about Fox News? Do I get better looking? Do our sad little graphics packages get any more tidy? No, they do not. <laughs> the numbers rise then because there is an appetite for hearing that media figures on the right are terrible people doing terrible things. Here is the terribleness. That same ap appetite is evident on the other side. Then I have the inches thick pile of threats to prove it. Threats um, surge not when my show uh, reports or makes big news about some politician or even, even when I cover violent extremism, which I do pretty often and in some uh, tedious detail. Threats surge and, and hate mail and all the rest when media figures on the right single me out for being, wait for it, right? Terrible person doing terrible things. Here is the terribleness, the terribleness of me. Politics has always been entertaining, but the pure entertainment value was always, always mucked up a little bit by the actual work of governing. Elections are definitely fun, but it is harder to get your bloodlust punch and Judy on for whether or not the state of New Jersey really is going to pay its share of the cost for that new tunnel into Manhattan. We have created a system in the media in which the pure malevolent glee and, and demonization and dirty tricks and kinetic heat of the horrible last days of particularly brutal elections can happen all year round now. And, and we, the players, we, the combatants, unlike real politicians who win real political battles, we do not muck up the fun of this vainglorious combat by actually taking the job, um, by taking responsibility for governing policy, for law, for our country's standing in the world. It used to be that um, it was hard to get a mortgage, right? Um, the bank was giving you a huge loan, and the bank made it hard to prove to them that you would pay it back. 
Because if you didn't pay it back, it was that bank that was lending you the money that was going to be left in the lurch. Right? So you represent a risk to the bank. They make sure that risk is as small and manageable as possible before they lend you money to buy the house. That was the system. Getting a mortgage was a total pain. Then we developed this genius system in which a bank would issue you a loan to buy a house, but then they would sell that loan to somebody else. So what does that do to all the incentives, right? Now, you no longer represent a risk to the bank that is approving you for this loan. They will make you a loan. Sure, just sign here. Here's a coffee mug. If you never pay it back, who cares? Not their problem. You are not a risk to them because they sold your loan and the risk that you would never pay it back downstream somewhere. We made a market in mortgages that had nothing to do with houses. We have also made a market in electioneering that has nothing to do with taking office. We have decoupled the process from the responsibility, and we are making a killing doing it. Opinion-driven media makes the money that politically neutral media loses. Now, lament, lament, gnashing of teeth, rending of garments. Um, <clears throat> if you're either in the old media or if you are somebody who feels very soft focusy about the old media. Go for it. That, that is definitely one way to see it, and I understand the consternation. The other way to see it, though, is, hey, wow, somebody is making a ton of money in the news. Sustainable business plan? More like a gold mine. And that can, in a way, be seen as great for the news business, if you believe that what's proving profitable now is actually the news in this business, if you believe that you can see journalism from my proverbial house. <laughs> can, can you hear election results from someone you know thinks one side has mostly bad ideas and the other side has mostly good ideas? Can you hear about the bizarre Rube Goldberg politics of trying to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell from someone who has made pretty clear that they think Don't Ask, Don't Tell is a failed policy? Can you hear about controversial past statements of someone hired by the Obama administration from someone who is clearly looking to create political problems for the Obama administration because they do not like that administration? Can you hear about a politician deriding the other side as the party of food stamps from an anchor who references as part of his report the fact that he was raised on food stamps? Can you hear about our country from people who are actually recognizable as part of our country? Can you hear the news from a particular voice, from a particular whole three-dimensional person? Can you hear me now? I understand that there is consternation about the particularness uh, of the people from whom Americans are getting their news now, about our identifiable opinions, our identifiable points of view, our specific backgrounds. But do you believe us we may not ever have one voice of authority for the whole country again. And as somebody who never really felt that voice spoke for me anyway, frankly, I do not share the nostalgia. But just because the voice of God mainstream by force, single authority media is not coming back, does not mean that authority itself is lost. Telling the truth, bringing to light reportable facts, explaining reportable facts and putting them in accurate context, that is the nuts and bolts every day, same as it ever was. And it is the basis on which I believe everybody in this business should be judged. It is not, however, the basis on which we will succeed or fail commercially. What's working commercially is political conflict. As a person um, who is not much of a screamer, I can, I can sort of, I can see the, the hamster wheels of that at work when some mild disagreement I've had, some exchange of differing points of view, no matter how polite, is marketed online as an epic clash, a smackdown. <laughs> I mean, for, for websites seeking video clicks, after the jump, the epic clash, um, it is the exclamation points that sell, right? As, as it always has been and it always shall be. Maybe it's websites now, but it was broadsides before. Lamenting bloodlust, lamenting prurience has always been a uh, rather predictable and rather pointless American pastime. Ultimate fighting will render boxing quaint. Pacquiao versus Margarito last night notwithstanding. 
Uh, teenagers will shock adults with their behavior at school dances. No matter how much they insist that they are on their own moral high ground of their own graphic depart graphics department's making, uh, CNN is just not going to outrate Fox. Ted Koppel is never going to get to be Walter Cronkite. Nobody's going to get to be Walter Cronkite. <laughs> if you want to change what works, you need more than just lamenting what's not going to happen again. You need to come up with something that works better. The media, in my view, is going to be fine. Journalism is going to be fine. The news is going to be fine. The problem in turning politics into profitable and high-profile TV news right now is not what it does to TV, not what it does to journalism, not what it does to news. It's what it does to politics. When we made a market for mortgages that had nothing to do with houses, the result was not good for houses. The result was not good for the baseline American need to keep people in houses. When we made a market for electioneering that had nothing to do with taking office, the thing to worry about that is taking office. The thing to worry about that because of that decision we have made um, is what it does to governing. There's a reason people in opinion-driven news flirt with running for office. It gives you a rating spike. Duh. There's a reason, though, that people flirt with it but don't do it. Uh, there's a reason why the version of electioneering done for TV purposes, in my view, should be divorced from actual fundraising and political donations. It is not to protect us. We are not fragile. It is to protect politics. There are advantages to the many voices of authority model that we've got now in American news. Uh, it means that, that one super elite guy <laughs> it's always a guy. One super elite guy's voice um, is not always the biggest or most important voice anymore. It means that the habitual suck up to power and the trading of corrupt discretion for access to those in power has been, or at least is starting to be repla replaced by a much more contrary or at least diverse ethos. It means that news does not have to shiver under the threat of financial unsustainability like it did in those days everybody feels so nostalgic for when network newscasts lost bucket loads of money and that was something to be proud of. There are some advantages to the way that things are now. The threat, though, is that people in politics decide to drop governing. Uh, to drop governing uh, to instead build their influence as if they are media figures only. Since the midterm elections, both Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina and former House Majority Leader and now goat farmer Dick Armey um, have advised newly elected conservative members of Congress and the Senate to avoid committees. They didn't say it together, two separate speeches. They're advising newly elected conservative members of Congress and the Senate to avoid seeking good positions on congressional committees. Both men arguing that committee assignments are used as plums by the parties, as leverage to get members to go along with legislation those members might not otherwise vote for. Jim DeMint and Dick Armey say, don't fall for it. Committees also happen to be where Congress does its work. It's where Congress does all the work that they do and, you know, making law and stuff. <laughs> if newly elected members of Congress are supposed to avoid committee assignments, what exactly are they supposed to be doing with their newfound jobs as legislators? <laughs> the implicit message is that they are supposed to keep politicking. They're supposed to keep talking, keep fighting, keep sharpening the differences, keep drawing lines in the sand, keep, I mean, let's face it, keep going on TV and talking smack. That's the worry. I know everybody is sad that they're not going to be Walter Cronkite, but the real worry is not that newsmen don't get to grow up to have no competition anymore. The real worry is that losing vice presidential candidates quit their half-finished governor's jobs for television gigs as some approximation of becoming the press before they run for president. Nothing that happens on TV builds that tunnel that we need from New Jersey to Manhattan. Nothing that happens on TV runs the country, or regulates factory farms, or gets real about social security, or exalts our country's place among the nations. The press may now approximate what it is to run for office, but we approximate very, very poorly what it is to hold office. 
The conflation of those two things is good for TV. It is not necessarily bad for journalism, although I look forward to fighting with you about that in the Q&A. But I do think it's bad for governance. Whether or not you believe that the mainstream press is slowly evaporating probably depends on how you feel about the word mainstream. It may also depend on whether or not you used to have a job in the old media and whether or not that job still exists. Lamenting changes in the media is a little bit like lamenting changes in kids these days in that horrible modern music. The complaint is not much different than it was in the 1950s and the pace of change is not much affected by the lamentation. Missing the unsustainable things that we feel moony about in journalism but we've lost at this point is academic. Bad setting to make that claim, I know. <laughs> but frankly, the press did not disappear. The press did not evaporate. The press changed, and it is still changing. And so far, what it has changed into is both dangerous and creative. It is both smart and more than occasionally stupefying. It makes people hate the press broadly, and it also makes people find their heroes among the press. It is not brave, this new world, but it is new. Thanks very much. I want to get a picture of you. We'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just stay right here. Rachel Maddow will take questions. We have um, microphones here, here, and up here, and up there. Uh, if you would, remember the rules. Identify yourself. Uh, ask a question. It needs to end in a question mark. Uh, and make it brief, because I know there'll be a lot. Artie. Hi. Is this on? Yes. yes. Okay. My name's Artie Sorry. Shahani. Uh, very nice to have you here and to bring us together on a Sunday night. I'm in my second year at the Kennedy School of Government, uh, fixated on the conversation between you and John Stewart the other day, and wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit critically on liberal media's coverage of the Tea Party. So you have, it's not monolithic, right? Sarah Palin, the sex kitten, Ron Paul, the anti-immigrant who's also against the war on drugs, it's sort of a, a huge spread. And I'm wondering, do you think that the caricaturing of this Tea Party, if you think that there is one, has actually hurt the ability to look at the parts of it that might be more progressive, that might be anti-elite, for example, to redefine a center that's in fact more progressive. Thank you very much uh, for the question. And let the record show that Sarah Palin as sex kitten was your characterization <laughs> and not mine. Um, I don't even want to get near the feline part of that. Um, I, um, I think that it is worth interrogating caricatures of all kinds in politics, and I think that the Tea Party has been very easily caricatured. I mean, I think you've seen this, um, an admission of that, and an actually sort of an attempted correction on that when um, the host on Fox News Channel, Glenn Beck, advised his followers to stop wearing dumb costumes to events, like stop dressing up as the Statue of Liberty. The thing that was very awkward about that is because the same day, uh, I think it was the same day, if it wasn't the same day, it was the same week, uh, Clarence Thomas's wife had just launched uh, the new um, buy foam Statue of Liberty headpieces from me at Liberty Central at her Tea Party merchandising organization. So there's been some back, so I think two steps forward, two steps back. You think I made it up, it's not true. Um, so I, I think that there, it has been an easily caricatured thing. I think that, um, I think that, it, that, that it is, that we are always looking for things to easily caricature. Um, in politics. I, I will say though that my, the initial coverage that I did of the Tea Party actually featured 
Ron Paul because and, and featured some of the people who had done tea parties before they were branded as tea parties this year uh, because that's something that is it goes back to the tax protest movement and goes back to generations. I mean, in the, in this, in the 1976 bicentennial celebrations uh, here in Boston, the tea parties that happened around that were the sort of on the, on the progressive side of the way that people wanted to celebrate the bicentennial of the country in a more progressive way. So I am interested in a lot of the nuances and history of it. Um, and that was easier to do at the beginning before it became, I think, a big astroturfed corporate front group. So. Uh, hi, my name is Joel Engardio. I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School. I have a free speech question. Okay. Um, freedom in America is complex. For example, gays seek equality from a constitution that allows religions to say gay is sin. And this fall, we've seen a number of gay teens commit suicide. Uh, we've also seen a great campaign, the it's Get, It Gets Better campaign, which um, adults, gay and straight, tell kids, hang in there, it gets better. Um, but the founder of the campaign, uh, Dan Savage, the columnist, has been very vocal saying religion is part of the problem and that religious leaders who make gay teens feel worthless are, are actually could be accomplices to their death. And so and, um, my question is, in your opinion, how do we make or help gay teens feel better about themselves when their parents are raising them in religions that use anti-gay religious speech protected by the First Amendment? Um, it's a big and complicated question. I, I mean, I think that my, my, my big picture advice on gay rights, um, I try to always preface by saying that um, gay people should come out. That that is, if, if people who are uh, gay, bisexual, um, lesbian, or transgendered um, have a responsibility to our own community because we are a community, um, to be out, and there are circumstances under which people face incredible discrimination, and there's, I don't judge anybody who chooses not to come out, but to the extent that it is possible to do so, everybody needs to, because every person who comes out is a potential lifeline for somebody who is considering whether or not they can ever come out. And so, if the country is filled with literally tens of millions of lifelines, we are in a better position than we are uh, if people feel like they are alone. Um, so I think that's, that, to me, that's always just been part of my personal ethics around it. In terms of um, the religious freedom and constitutional protections for civil rights, um, the, the right has, has caricatured um, the efforts to defend the separation of church and state as, a, as, as secularism, um, as if it is force, foisting an, an atheism almost on, um, on our, our national discussions about what's right and what's wrong. I am a very firm believer in the separation of church and state because I don't think I have any right as a public figure, and certainly if I were ever a politician, which I will never be, to tell anybody anything about their faith, nor do I think that anybody else's faith should govern what our public policy is on matters of constitutional freedoms. So I think standing up for the separation of church and state and refusing to allow it to be caricatured is one way to move forward on civil rights and civil rights save lives. Up here. Hi. My name is Jason Birkenfeld. I'm a senior at the college and president of the Harvard College Democrats, and I'm here tonight with a few members of our organization. Um, Two-part question. The first part's related to claiming the moral high ground. Um, and you spoke a lot about how both the liberal media and the conservative media fall victim to this us versus them mentality, where both sides claim to be right and claim that the other side is wrong. Um, now, as a Democrat, and I'm sure you may agree, I tend to believe that our side is right and the other side is wrong. So, I certainly hope so. Right, so, <laughs> Related to that, how do, you, how do you step back and from an objective point of view prove that we are right and the other side is wrong <laughs> and avoid claims of simply being biased? Um, and the second part, we actually have these t-shirts that we're selling that depict Glenn Beck um, and it says, Glenn Beck got one thing right, he dropped out of Yale. <laughs> because Glenn Beck took a class at Yale. So we were wondering if we would be able to give one of these shirts to you at the end of the show. Um, I, would, I would certainly have that, I would certainly accept the t-shirt from you. I will not wear it. Fair point. <laughs> um, you Deal. can't make me. Deal. Um, <laughs> but thank you. Um, and thank you, I mean, thank you for being politically active in college and for being uh, involved in, in political activism. I... Um, I think that you prove that you are right in the way that you are, uh, in the same way that you are taught to prove that you are right in philosophy class. 
Um, I think that you, in order to be right, you need um, the facts on your side. You need a good appreciation not only of the evidence that is on your side, but the evidence arrayed against you, the appropriate way to organize it, and the um, uh, and a memorization of enough of those things that you can be quick in rebutting people who try to take advantage of um, you not understanding that. The, the skill of argument is my single, is the, is, is the thing about my job that is most difficult and most exciting and most rewarding. Um, you have to be good at making a case for yourself. The, your, your conviction that you feel right is actually a disadvantage in winning an argument. Um, you need to understand more about the other side of your argument than you do about your own in order to build the best, strongest case for it. Take philosophy and math classes if you still have time. No? Yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, my name's Sorby Grant and I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School and I'm also one of the lead editors for the LGBTQ Policy Journal, which is actually its first year we're gonna be publishing in the spring. And as far as we know, we're currently the only of its kind we come to you today for some advice, given the fact that you're one of the few who talked about the Ugandan situation, one of the few who constructively discuss LGBTQ issues. What are some of the gaps that you think we should be filling in the public policy discourse? In terms of international? International and national. I, let me ask you specifically, do you mean what do you think, that, what do I think that you could most effectively advocacy, advocate for from the perspective that you're in now, or do you, are you asking what we should do as a country? what we should be doing from the, what you from should the be doing. position we are in. Yes. Um, be junior reporters. Find out stuff that's happening that other people don't know it's happening and prove it. Um, the, one of the reasons that I think that uh, people assign the rise of opinion-driven uh, cable news um, responsibility for the death of reporting is because reporters don't get front paged in the way that they do on a network news broadcast, right? Network news broadcast, we'll go to our correspondent in Kabul for more on that. Hi, I'm the reporter who learned their information and then put on an incredibly nice suit. Here's the information. Um, but even though we don't front page it in that same way because we're personality driven, everything that we do depends on reporting. And Frankly, without factual information on which to base arguments, we can't make arguments about these things. And so one thing that's nice about student journalism and about academic work is that there is a collegiality of the academy that allows you to reach people, uh, to reach students, to reach other people doing academic writing in countries that maybe Americans should understand more about what's going on in them. So make connections in Uganda if you want to talk about Uganda. Um, make connections with, um, I, I mean, places like Venezuela. There are other places in which there are things that are of great interest in which if you can bring the facts to light and prove them, you will drive the national discussion as well as, I think, illuminating your own readers. Thank you. Hi, I'm J.D. Gladden from the Grad School of Education, um, and I am just curious if you might speak a little bit about uh, your experiences um, in sort of throughout your career, how, um, what, how your sexuality you think has affected your, um, maybe your rise to fame or what kind of obstacles you faced at all, if you're willing to speak about that a little bit. Um, thank you for the question. I think my answer will disappoint you. Um, I have been asked this before and I actually, I find it hard to answer because I have never been a straight person. <laughs> uh, or when I was, I was in high school and very awkward. Um, and so I, I did not set out to do this as my job. I f fell into it. Um, and I have been out and totally out since I was 17. Um, thank you for telling the story about the incredibly stupid way in which I came out. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> you'll never outlive it even when you're more than twice that age. Um, and so I don't know. It's hard for me to know um, what, uh, where, if, if there are things, if, if I would be further along in my career, um, than I am now, if I'm not, if, it, if it's meritocracy, if it's prejudice, I don't know. Um, there have been very few instances in my life in which I think people told me exactly what they were thinking about me. And it's probably true of most of us here. You don't get much of it to your face until it's too late. So, I don't know, I'm real happy with my job though. Uh, my name is Krishna Prabhu and I'm a senior at Harvard College. Uh, I have found inspiration from your work as an AIDS activist, particularly your participation in the Gore's Greed Kill protest of 1999. And recently, AIDS activists at Harvard, Yale, and Dartmouth have disrupted, have used the same tactic by disrupting President Obama's speeches because he has broken his campaign promises on global AIDS funding. 
Though many journalists have claimed that the, there, there's an enthusiasm gap among young progressives, I would argue that young people are now beginning to fight for a truly progressive agenda for issues like global aids or don't ask, don't tell. My question to you is this. Would you consider doing a story on young progressives who are trying to hold their politicians accountable on both the left and the right? Um, I, consider, I consider stuff all the time, and so I'm considering that right now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so in, in, in direct and respectful response to the, to the, the pointed nature of your question, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't do stories on request. However, I think that you're, the premise of your question is uh, absolutely based in fact. And um, there is a uh, bipartisan, facile rejection of direct action politics that is boring in the mainstream media. In that, uh, anybody participating in direct action politics is assumed to be immature and not worth engaging with, I think, in the, in the mainstream media. And I define mainstream in a broad sense. Um, and I don't share that. Um, I think that direct action activists are not only uh, brave, they are often, uh, they, they are sometimes right, and they are often very articulate advocates for their own position. So um, I'm interested in direct action, I'm interested in what progressive politics means in the age of Obama, and I think we sort of cover that in an ongoing way. Um, but most of all, thank you for being active in the type of work that you do, and thanks for the question. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for being here. My name is Katie Zbotsky. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm also a board member of the Harvard College Democrats. Um, a mentor of mine once told me that journalists are journalists because they believe that reporting on what goes on in the world is the best method they have for changing the world. And I think that's something I and a lot of students here struggle with about whether as progressive people, as people who believe in social justice, if we can best change the world through journalism or through engaging in the political process as by working on campaigns or running for office. So I was just curious about as to how you personally uh, realized that your method of changing the world was through journalism rather than politics. I stopped trying to change the world um, on March 9th, March 9th, 2004. Um, that's when I started, that was my first day at Air America. Um, I really, my life, my, my life up until that point had been as my primary, my primary self-definition was as an activist. And in deciding to do media as a full-time thing, I, I quite literally stopped being an activist and started being a different thing. All of the different um, things that I was responsible for and the different types of activism that I was doing, I remember sending out mass emails and saying, I will no longer be doing this for a while while I start doing this other thing. I have a feeling it's not going to last, so I'll be back in a few months. Um, <laughs> sorry, you guys. Um, and so I, I think a lot of people see the, because I, because I share my opinion, uh, as part of what I do, um, I think a lot of people still see me as an activist. I do not. Um, I do think that it is possible to see yourself to try to change the world through journalism, but it is it takes an incredible it takes an incredible optimism, I think, to approach it that way. I think that what journalists do is they increase the amount of useful information in the world that you are trying to not change the world but explain it, and it takes it, it is an incredible leap of optimism to think that good explaining will lead a well-informed populace to make changes for the better that you will agree with. Um, it is, it's, it's an almost, um, uh, it's an almost sublime faith in, um, in human possibility that every once in a while I feel, but mostly I don't. Hi. My name is Jimmy Biblars. I'm a freshman in the college, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. I also am not a big fan of the cold. Um, <laughs> As someone who has often been categorized as one of the kids these days, I tend to agree with you about lamenting, you know, nostalgically old sources. But um, I have a question about new media, as you talked about. With the decline of network and newspaper-driven media, how do you guarantee that with the advent of cable-driven and blog-based media that low-income people have access to high-quality news? The one thing that is... Um, I think positive about the change for low-income people and other traditionally marginalized people is that without one big voice of God authority as the expectation for what counts as, what counts as solid news, what counts as high-quality news, there is room for voices that are not just that one elite voice. Uh, and so I think that means that there is room 
Um, it's certainly not, we certainly haven't realized its potential yet, but there is, there is room for um, a lot more different types of people to be involved in authoritative discussion. Um, and I think that there's room, I mean, you see it, you see it, I think, now that the, the blog world is mature enough now that I think we have seen it evolve into, we've, we've seen it evolve in an utterly meritocratic way. Um, blogs that are good blogs that give authoritative information and that move the ball forward and that often are the most reported of all the blogs have risen to become full-time jobs for the people who run those blogs. It is a meritocracy and that is, um, that's blind uh, in, a, in the best possible way. So I do think there's a, po a real possibility to add more diverse voices to the mix and that's already happening and that's awesome. In terms of getting high quality news, um, when there isn't I mean, the cheapest thing will always be the most available, but um, what helps right now is that almost everything's free. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm David Wittenberg. I'm a second year student in the law school. In my previous life, I was a college journalist um, and started out on the news side, but um, then when it came time to run for positions instead of managing editor, I became the opinion editor. Um, I think that decision was in part because of the character of the previous administration, also in part um, because my heroes had shifted from people like Teddy White to people like Hunter Thompson, and I had this sense that doing something like your show was more effective um, in today's climate than doing something like you know, Woodward and Bernstein um, <laughs> had done. So my question is, you know, doing something that was more advocacy. And I felt that not, not only as a citizen, but as a journalist, you could somehow be more effective doing um, advocacy or opinion journalism in this climate. Um, so I want to push you to define a little more your thoughts on um, Keith's recent in incident. I mean, given the fact that you're already, or I would submit that um, you and Keith are each already doing some form of advocacy. Um, on MSNBC, I mean, doesn't his, don't his donations, aren't they sort of in keeping with what's already going on, and don't they fulfill some sort of primeval liberal desire to just throw a brick? Uh, I think that, um, I think that, and I mean, there's a, there's, a broad, there's a broad spectrum of views on this within the business. I don't speak for anybody other than myself in saying this, but I think that I'm very comfortable with NBC's rule against uh, those of us who are on TV donating to candidates. Um, and as I mentioned in this speech, I think that it is not to um, protect us. I don't think it actually has much to say. Whether or not Keith or I or anybody on TV gave money to somebody doesn't actually tell you much more about our political views than we're already acting out on television. That's not the point. I think people sort of miss the point that the point is, is, is protecting politics. If politicians know that they can raise money from pundits and raise money on pundit shows, that turns, that, that changes politics in a way. We saw that, I think, in part with the Sharon Engel candidacy uh, for Senate in Nevada. She was the Republican Party's nominee against Harry Reid, and she stopped doing all local media in Nevada, despite the fact that it was Nevada voters voting on her, because she didn't want to lose the opportunity cost of perhaps raising money on Sean Hannity's show. So she was only doing media in which she would not get answered, not get asked difficult questions, but she could raise money. That is great for Sean Hannity. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's not, that's not doing any damage to the Fox News brand, but it is doing damage to the ability of the people of Nevada to make a judgment about that candidate based on questions from reporters who understand Nevada issues and demand Nevada answers. So it's bad for governance. Um, for people in media to give donations or to be raising money um, on the air for candidates. I don't really think it has much of an effect on what we do. But what about more broadly? I mean, you say that you are no longer an activist, but A, aren't you, and B, is that such a bad thing? Aren't I? No. Um, is that a bad thing? No, but it's the way I think about it. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Bash Kia. I'm a first year student at the Kennedy School. Um, my question has to do with the charge often leveled by conservatives against the mainstream media that uh, it tends to f uh, be biased in favor of Democrats. Um, there seems to be a belief out there that to be considered truly unbiased or nonpartisan, the media um, 
basically needs to split the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, irrespective of what the positions uh, held by either side. Um, uh, in practice, however, this seems to place on the media a re requirement um, that if it wants to be seen as nonpartisan, they have to give at least some kind of credence to, um, say, fabrications, distortions of the truth, uh, obscurantism. Um, so my question is basically, why doesn't the media uh, push back against this notion uh, more vehemently that they're partial to Democrats? Um, from my vantage point, it seems like um, in most cases the media... Let her answer the question. Okay. Um, I think we do. Um, I think that we push back both on the idea... I mean, I, at least I, I, do not game, I do not accept the idea that um, I'm pulling... Uh, that I've got a horse in the race, that I'm pulling for a particular party, uh, that, I am a, um, uh, that I'm a Democratic mouthpiece. I think if you asked the White House if they felt like I was an effective Democratic mouthpiece for them, they'd be very annoyed with even the question. Um, so I think that I push back on it. And I also think that the idea that you give equal time um, to, to, uh, to, to two sides of every view as if two sides of every view tells you more of the truth than, um, than being judicious in, 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 in communicating the facts in their relevant context to your viewers. I think really it's only CNN who's still stuck in that and they're paying for it. We're running out of time so I'm gonna ask, we're gonna let each one of you ask a question but if you would please make it a short question. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Elrod, one of the co-chairs of the Queer Women's Organization here on campus. Um, Recently, Kathy Griffin, when sh suggesting you, said that America really needs a focused lesbian in the White House. And since you have confirmed over and over again that you will not run for office and we don't have the privilege to elect you, what do you suggest that America look out for? You mean, who's the focused lesbian that we should pick? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I love Harvard. <laughs> um, what focused lesbian should we have for president? I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea. I've never thought about it in those terms ever, but I didn't know that Kathy, Kathy Griffin said that, and you've totally made my night. So thank you. I'm sorry I can't answer. Hello, I'm Samuel Coffin. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, my question is, I guess we saw with another question, there seems to be a lot of frustration with the left wing about uh, what they see as broken campaign promises. But now that the Republicans have taken back the House and a lot of... Democrats survived the elections by uh, distancing themselves away from a lot of the Obama agenda. How much do you think Obama is going to move to the center in this political environment, and how do you think that will further affect his relationship with the left wing of his party? It's a very good question, and it's, go it's going to be what we get to focus on for about five minutes. I would love for this to be the interesting thing that we're all watching unfold for the next year in the country, but the, it seems like the 2012 presidential campaign started the day after the elections, literally started on Wednesday. That was the day, it was, the elections were on Tuesday, Sarah Palin put out her presidential campaign ad on Wednesday, with the big bear at the end of it. Ah. And I, I think that, I think that that means that very little of the interesting hashing it out that needs to happen among Democrats post this election is just gonna get is going to just get, I think, shunted to the side in terms of jockeying for position for 2012. Um, my, my feeling about this president is that he um, turns to the center almost reflexively. And so I think that I've seen that a lot in the first two years that he's been there. I think he will continue to do that, not necessarily at a greater pace um, in these next two years. Um, I do think that if the Democrats in the House keep Nancy Pelosi as leader, there will be, uh, that will be a means of stoking the base and keeping people fired up, which, in, I mean, it's Democrats' great lament, right? When the, when, when the Democratic base is fired up, they are not fired up against Republicans. They are fired up against themselves. <laughs> so um, for better, for the, too much to the White House's chagrin, I think Pelosi staying there will keep Democrats fired up on the president's left flank. Final question. I'm Dick Tofel, I'm the general manager of ProPublica. Um, and my question is, I, I heard you say, I think, that your business in some important ways is bad for governance in this country. Um, in any event, what kind of personal responsibility do you feel for that? What do you 
feel like you need to do, I mean, we're not gonna vote for federal office in this country for another 24 months. What can you do to do things that promote a conversation about governance? I think that it's a totally fair and good question. I think that the, I recognize that what drives viewers and therefore what drives influence is political conflict. And um, my, my own conscience drives me to not hype it, but to still present it. I think that <laughs> sort of the way that I think about my patriotic responsibilities in this business that I'm in is to make policy make TV, is to make, pol to force policy onto the air instead of just politics. And so that doesn't just mean going to Afghanistan so that we end up doing coverage from, uh, coverage, wall to wall coverage of the war and nothing else those days that I'm there. It means going to Afghanistan and doing those shows in a way that keeps the ratings up so that A, I can keep going, so that other people will be able to go too, and so that I get to stay on the air. And so it's this sort of constant leavening of what I think is useful uh, to what I know works. I really enjoy the stuff that works. I really enjoy talking about politics and political conflict. I've, I'm super interested and engaged and have a great time doing that, so it's not like spinach. It's, it's all right. But to force discussions about governing and about policy um, and about things that don't have, that don't even have legislation attached to them but are big questions about what's right for the country um, is sort of the, it's the, it's the stream we, we swim up against every day. Um, but it's something that I think about every day. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Rachel Maddow and congratulate Bill Greider, uh, the Shorenstein family, the Nyan family. We will continue this conversation on the top floor of this building tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock uh, with a panel that will include Charlie Gibson. I'm going to be very interested to hear what you might have to say about what Rachel Maddow was talking about tonight and David King and others. We hope that some of you will join us. You're certainly most welcome, as I say, up at the top. 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, we'll have coffee. We'll hope we'll see you there. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>